Konnichiwa, my people. Yes, we're going to learn a little Japanese to start out day two of our Asian culture comparison. So to say hello, we say Konnichiwa. Try it with me. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. To say thank you, we say Arigato. Arigato. Try it with me. Arigato. And to say goodbye, we say Sayonara. 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 Okay? So we're going to try to work on those today. Until tomorrow, say konnichiwa or arigato as you're talking to each other. So if you recall yesterday, I'm going to kind of forward our notes here. We were talking about my little trip out to the mountain with the monks, right? And um, I wanted to tell you one other story. We ended by seeing how they called all creatures to worship. And uh, then we got to have lunch with these monks. And we were told a couple of things that we needed to do to respect their traditions. The first thing you need to know is that they don't speak during a meal because they are constantly to be thanking their god or gods, in this case Buddha, for the food that we have before us. So you eat in silence. Remember that they are also vegetarian because they believe in reincarnation. So we had kind of a, a stew without meat on top of rice. And it was actually really good. And um, they said, you can eat as much as you want. You can go back as many times as you want, but you need to eat everything on your plate. And that means down to every single grain of rice. So, because obviously, you know, if you're hungry, you eat, but if you're wasting it, then someone else doesn't get the food that they need. So that's kind of their belief system. It was really cool. I learned a lot of new things that I'd never seen before while I was there. So you're always learning, right? Okay, so while we were there, we went and saw their Buddhist statue, and this is a place where they can worship. And I found it really interesting. There were these paintings up that had been there for a long, long time, and it showed the different stories in the Buddhist faith, and you'll see there are similarities to some of the stories we have in the Bible. Like, for example, on the left here, You'll see this is a picture of Buddha who goes off by himself to pray in the wilderness and he is tempted by these three temptress women. How does that compare with something in the Bible? Yeah, the story of Jesus going out into the wilderness and he's tempted by Satan, kind of the same idea. In the next picture, you'll see that this woman is washing Buddha's feet with oil and her hair. And if you remember, um, that actually happens to Jesus at one point. Can you guess what the one is here on top? Yep. Think of Jonah and the whale. He's swallowed by the whale, right? Same thing here. Buddha ends up being swallowed by a big fish. And can you guess the last one? You got it. Walking on water. And obviously, we see that in both situations. So I thought it was really interesting. Here there are you know, worlds away, and yet they have similar stories. Kind of neat. Now, this story I don't think we have in the Bible, and this is Buddha forgiving a serial killer. Now, I'm not telling you that Jesus wouldn't forgive a serial killer, and maybe he did, but I don't think that's a major Bible story we teach children anyway. Uh, I thought it was rather interesting. The story goes that this serial killer would keep a finger from every victim that he killed, and he would make a necklace out of those fingers. So that's what you see here on the picture on the right. And Buddha forgives that killer. So what was the number one religion in Korea? Remember, it was Christianity, right? So now let's take a look at Japan. What is the number one religion? It is Shinto. Yeah. Number two would be Buddhist. Number three would be Christian. Number four would be other. So Shinto is the number one. But um, one thing Koto would tell you is that most Japanese people are irreligious. Now understand that that does not mean atheist. It means that they do believe in that God or gods in their particular religion. It's just that they don't practice it like we do. So they maybe don't go to church on Sunday or don't go to youth group or Sunday school, but they still believe, okay? So let's take a look at Shintoism a little bit. Shintoism is all about the kami. Kami means spirits, and in their culture, the spirits are the gods of Shinto, and they believe that there are good and bad kami, 
and they can come in many forms. They can be in the form of an animal, like the white wolf you see there on the right. They could be plants, lakes, rivers. Um, and like we said, if something bad happens in the world, they would say that it was caused by bad kami. So let's say that um, my son drowns in the river. Well, they would explain that as there was a bad kami in the river. The river was a bad kami. Um, if you watch any anime, you'll see that they use this idea in a lot of their storylines. Now in China, what is the number one religion? Biggest area here first is non-religious again. Good. The second group is 28.5, and that is Chinese religions. And those include Taoism and Confucianism. Now let's be clear, first of all, uh, we know that Confucianism really isn't a religion, is it? What, who was Confucius, you know? Yeah, he was a philosopher, basically, an Asian philosopher, and he had certain ways that you should live your life, and so these people do follow those ways, and it does affect the choices they make. However, it's not like he was a god or it's a religion, necessarily. So let's take a look at Taoism. You'll actually see Taoism has a lot of impact on our culture here in America, even. First of all, the symbol of yin and yang comes from Taoism. And notice the dark side is called yin, and that represents negative, dark, and feminine. The other side is yang, and that re represents positive, bright, and masculine. They're always opposites. Now, I, I'm really summarizing this here, but here are some of the basic beliefs of Taoism. First of all, they believe in the idea of Tao, which means the way or the path of life. They say that you have to accept the good and bad parts about your life, and you must flow with the path life sends on you. So, you know, good and bad things are going to happen, and we're going to follow Tao. They also believe in the three jewels or the three treasures, and that should be behind every single decision you make in your life. The first one is compassion for others, caring for others, doing things for others, helping those who are hurt. The second is moderation, moderation in everything you do, whether it's um, drinking too much, shopping too much, you know, buying too many things, they want to be moderate. The third thing is humility. They believe you need to be humble and not feel like you are above anybody else. And if you do those things, you will be a kind and gentle spirit. They also believe that you should have a very natural and simple life. You need to take time every day to just sit and listen to your soul and what's really going on in your mind and in your heart. Because so many times we have people telling us things around us and we sometimes need to just listen to ourselves. What do we call that when we sit and we just listen? Meditation, yeah, that's where meditation comes from. It's a Taoist belief. They also believe that you need to eliminate everything that's unnecessary from um, your big house to your boats to your fancy cars. They don't believe that you need all of that. It's not necessary. And they also believe that the world is in a constant cycle. So I might die today, tomorrow I might be a tree or a bird, and we just keep on living. We just come back as different things. Well, in the United States, we now see acupuncture, which is a Taoist belief, herbal medicine, comes from Taoism, meditation, and even martial arts stems its beginnings in Taoism. So now what I want to do is let's take a look at the different burial styles of the three cultures. And we're talking burial of royal family, okay? So in Korea, they use mounds for burial. Sorry, this is in the way there. As you can see right here, this is actually the tomb of King Sejong, one of the most important kings of Korean history. In front of the mound, you'll see that they have a table that kind of, um, it's actually where you can go and sacrifice animals. And then they also have guardians in front of those mounds. And they are designed to scare away evil spirits and also to prevent grave robbers from coming up. This is probably the most famous tomb in Korea because it is the only one that is open. It's really something I, I was impressed with. 
You know, if we had these mounds and we knew there were kings and queens in there, we would have dug up every single one and they would have been in a museum. But the Korean people opened up one. They said, I see now how it looks inside. We don't need to disturb any of the other bodies. So they actually leave them alone. This one was called the Heavenly Horse Tomb. And they actually had very great difficulty getting inside because it's kind of booby trapped. What they do is they basically build a room out of wood and that's where they put the body and all the items. And then they would take and they would put boulders all around the outside and pack it with dirt. So that if you tried to dig in, the boulders would fall down on top of you. So when they went in here, they had to be very careful, number one, not only to not get hurt, but they also didn't want the things to get damaged because it had been in there for so long. When they went in here, they found the body and they also found over 11,000 artifacts, all kinds of gold and, and little items. Um, can you think of anybody who does that that you learned about in middle school? The Egyptians, right? Yeah, even so much so that they bury their own pets with them and stuff like that. That's kind of the similar idea here. The reason it's called the Heavenly Horse Tomb is because you'll see that they found uh, this thing here, I'm not sure what you call that, but it goes on the neck of the horse, and they also have stirrups. And you notice it has a greenish red color to it. What they did is they took the covers of beetles, beetle shells, and they put them in there, and it still shows that color today. Now, there wasn't much left of the king, but he was wearing a gold crown that you see over here, and a necklace that had beads in it, and there was a gold belt, and then he also wore these gold shoes that you see here. It also included a child sarcophagus, so there must have been a child that was buried there as well. That was probably part of the royal family. These are pagodas, and you'll notice they're all different shapes and sizes. Um, they are designed to do two things, basically. First of all, they are a sign that tells you, this is where I can go to worship. So you usually find a pagoda wherever there's a Buddha. So imagine way back, you know, 1850, and we're sitting here in Brandon, South Dakota. There are hardly any houses. It's all fields. But if I looked across the plains and I saw a pagoda that was 10 stories high over by Sioux Falls, I would know that's where I go to worship. Then they also used it kind of like a gravestone, either in it or under it. They would bury a bunch of relics, and they would even put the remains of the different Buddhas underneath these pagodas. So they're very unique. This one was built in 1348, and you'll notice that it is 10 stories high. The one on the left was built in 634 AD. Good grief, that's a long time. They believe it was seven to nine stories high, but unfortunately the Japanese came and took over Korea and they destroyed it. So we don't get to see the top anymore. But if you look and see this area right in here, that's where they put the remains of Buddha and all the relics. Now in Japan, just a second here, let me erase my mess so that you can start from scratch. Okay, um, Japan uses what are called kufun, which means ancient grave. Well, in the 3rd to 7th century AD, Japanese tombs look like tamuli, which means in the shape of a keyhole. And if you look at it, it really does kind of look like it, doesn't it? And the way they did this is they would have a mound burial, just like we saw in Korea, right here in the center, right? You go down in the center there. And if you cross-sectioned it, this is what it looks like. And then here, they would have stairs going up, and then you would walk across. And then what they would do is they would fill this field with water so that nobody could get to it, and it was protected. Well, as people started flying over the top of Japan, they could see all these interesting shaped keyholes. And they're thinking, man, this has to be man-made. And they started to realize that they had all of these burial tombs. There are over 30,000 kofun, and there's over 5,000 that you can go and visit today. So I cannot wait. I want to go see one myself. This is what it looks like on the inside, in case you're wondering. They had a lot of different colors and paintings and designs. This is the Ozuka Kofun. Ozuka means king's grave. 
And of course, then on the floor, they have the body and all of their valuables with them too. Now this one is super exciting. Um, have any of you seen the movie, The Mummy? Have you seen the recent one? And you remember they were chased by these terracotta warriors. Well, I don't know if you realize that, but that is a real thing. And I was so excited when I heard about this. So here's what happened. Um, recently, some people were doing some digging and they found one of the greatest archeological finds like ever in history. Turns out that this king, Qin Shi Hong, I'm terrible at that name, sorry. Um, the emperor decided he wanted a replica of his city underground. So in 246 BC, he took 700,000 workers and he worked them to the bone night and day to build a city underground until his death. And then they buried it all and it's been found. Um, you'll notice this is just one of the many rooms that they've discovered. This is probably the largest and you'll see it's filled with terracotta warriors. They're all individuals. And on the right, this is what they look like when it first happened. And now obviously over time, they've become discolored and stuff. Each figure was covered with beaten egg to help cover the colors painted on the figures. And originally they were done in really bright colors like you see here. Well, there were numerous rooms. Uh, this picture here on the left shows you the colors that we talked about. You can still see some red and yellow here. You'll also notice that every face is different. So it's almost like, you know, let's say that I was doing statues and I wanted a statue of each one of you here in this room. That's basically, I think, what they did. They tried to do a replica of every person in the city. The horses even look different if you look closely. Another room that they found had all kinds of chariots in it with horses. And if you remember in the movie, The Mummy, they're being chased by one of those chariots and then the horse's head gets cut off. I don't know if you remember that, but it's kind of funny. There are over 8,000 characters in the city so far. And since it was a copy of the city, they actually made rivers out of jewels and even a moon out of jewels. Now there are obviously valuables in there. So just like in the Indiana Jones movies, Raiders of the Lost Ark, they were booby trapped. So they have to be very careful. They are still digging because they have not discovered all of it yet. It's a huge site, uh, but every time they go in, they have to be careful for their own safety. Plus they don't want anything to get damaged. So it's been quite an exciting um, excavation. They have yet to open the king's tomb or the king's chambers. Now, if you think this stuff is awesome, can you imagine what they're gonna find in the king's tomb? It is gonna be so cool. So excited about that. So now we're gonna talk about art a little bit. Korean art is very literal. It's really easy, you guys because they basically exaggerate whatever it is they want you to know. So if you look at this guy right here, why do you suppose they made his head look like that? Yeah, because he's smart, because his brain is bigger than everybody else's. So that's their way of showing that he's smart. If you look at this picture here on the right, there are some people in this picture that are good and some people that are really bad. Can you tell which ones are evil? Good. You see how there's fire coming out of their heads back here and they have monster-like faces? That's a sign that they are evil and they're probably going to a bad place in the afterlife. Over here, you'll see they have halos, a symbol we even use today for angels, meaning that they're good people. Now over here, you'll see they have a mix. So my guess is they're probably walking the line a little bit and they're not sure quite where they're headed. So. A lot of Korean art includes animals as symbols. Like for example, the red crowned crane symbolizes luck or fidelity or loyalty to your mate. The turtle is really important in their culture. The shell represents heaven and the square under him represents earth. So uh, if you look back in their history, fortune tellers would actually read turtle shell patterns to find out their future. I think that's so interesting. The official symbol of Korea is the tiger because it represents strength and courage. Um, and if you have a white tiger, 
that is even more sacred. Um, and I thought that was interesting because if you look at the Native Americans in Dakota area, they also felt the same way about a white buffalo. Now think about this, you biology people. Why is it that a white buffalo or white tiger would be unique? Yep, because they're albino, right? Which doesn't happen that often. So obviously if they're rare, it means they believe they're more sacred or more special. Good. They even say supposedly that their country is shaped like a tiger. I don't know, what do you think? The most famous pottery in Korea is Celadon. And I'm really bummed. I wanted so bad to do like a whole tea set of Celadon to bring back and show you. But I got to tell you this cool story. Um, I went with a group of teachers, right? And they knew that I was trying to buy this set for you, but it was like 500 bucks. So I couldn't. So would you believe they all chipped in and they bought me a Celadon necklace? So I'll show you this. I'll bring it. I'll let you hand it around. Just please be careful with it because it's breakable. Now, if you notice on the Celadon pottery on the on the board, what color are they? They're green in hue, just like celery is. So think of Celadon celery like the greenish hue pottery. Easy to remember. In Japan, because they wrote with a brush instead of a pen, almost all of their art is with a brush and it's with ink. So here you see an ink partition that was paint, painted. It's quite often nature scenes like trees, mountains, rivers, stuff like that. And it's usually done in black ink. Even here, you'll see a, a plum blossom tree, cherry blossom tree, something like that. Their style of pottery is porcelain. And I remember that was one of the things that we would trade with Japan when we first started trading. Um, I don't know if any of you have porcelain dolls. Very breakable, very dainty, but beautiful. Chinese art, they actually do a couple things that I've not seen before. The first one they do is they actually do scrolls of drawings or paintings. I mean, we write letters on scrolls, but they actually paint it. So I'm actually going to come out of this to show you this. This one on the top is a scroll that was done in the 1100s, and it was about a festival that happened in this river town. So watch how they did this. So it keeps on going. So cool. Yeah. And then down below it, they have what's called an ink and wash painting. And what you do is you just put some ink on the paper where you want it, and then you let it get wet, and you let the water do the work. Sometimes it turns out, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, it turned out really cool. Kind of looks like trees down in the lower corner, and maybe mountains or cliffs up on the right-hand side. That's an ink and wash painting. In the Chinese culture, they believe that jade is a very special stone. They call it the stone of heaven and they consider it to have special powers for healing and for immortality. So this was rather unique. This uh, bodysuit that you see over here was discovered recently in 1973. It's from the Han Dynasty, like 200 BC to 200 AD, like Jesus Christ time, okay? Well, we found out that they made burial suits out of jade and they were sewn together with gold or silver thread. And the idea was they put them on the body of the dead person so that their souls would be immortal. Isn't that neat? Looks like Frankenstein with those boots. I think that's so cool. Hold on just a second. Okay, now I don't know how many of you have been like this, but I think I've maybe even said that sometime in my life that, oh, all those letters look the same. But when you look at the three cultures and you compare their writing, you'll notice that they do look different, don't they? Well, I'm gonna teach you a really fast and easy way to be able to tell the difference between the three, and you will need to know this on your test. So let me show you this little trick, it's really easy. So the first thing 
If you see lots of circles and ovals, think of like smiley faces, that's Korean. So if you look back at this picture, which one is Korean? Yep, the one on the left is Korean. If you see cute squiggly symbols that tend to have like a, a curvy look or a J look to it, like a fish hook, and notice there's a lot of different fonts, but notice they all have that. That is Japanese. So which one is Japanese? It is the one in the middle, yeah. See how we have that little curve here and here and here and here and here and here and here? Yeah, whereas Korean, remember, it has the smiley faces, right? They're usually made out of a circle, oval, or a straight line most of the time. Okay, and the third area, if it is big and scary with a lot of detail, that is Chinese. So obviously, look at the difference. Holy cow, this is Chinese. I also tend to notice it's very square in the way that it looks for the most part. Okay, so you already figured that out. Now I told you, I'm going to teach you some, like how to do Korean and stuff. But um, I'm going to save that for later, and we'll do that later because I want to talk about your assignments and stuff like that. Uh, before we do that, I want to talk about a couple of things. Uh, first of all, let me get you set up here. Okay, I'm going to be handing around a couple of things here. So this is Korean money. And what do you notice in there, Will? Yeah, a $5,000 bill. You want 5,000 bucks? Do you suppose it's worth 5,000 bucks? No, this is 5,000 won, and they actually do money in thousands in Korea. So this 5,000 is equivalent to $5 in the United States. So like this $1,000 bill is what you would use to get a pop, because that's worth $1. You would think they just get rid of the extra zeros. I think that's interesting. But so think about it. If you had something that was, I don't know, a hundred bucks, how many thousand? Yeah, isn't that something? It's weird to think about those numbers. So I'll hand that around. You can take a look at that and look at the coins and stuff. You'll also see that I have two fans here. One of them is from China and it's a dress fan. I got that as a gift from Mrs. Sturgeon when they had their little boy when they adopted him, so beautiful. This one is just a regular everyday fan. One of the things I found surprising is that Korean people use fans all the time because it's hot. It's kind of like the rainy season in Florida. And so you'll see a student sitting there and fanning themselves because it's just hot. Okay, let's see what else did I want to show you. Oh, and I have two picture books. There's a couple of things that I want you to see in here as we hand it around. The first thing I want you to do is um, write down this word, Chiangwade. Chiangwade. Chiangwade is the name of the Korean White House, basically. Except they call it the Blue House because it's blue. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't go and actually tour the Blue House because I hadn't gotten my security all passed. Um, and obviously, this is Korea, so they do have pretty tight security, but I could see it from about a block away. So I want you to see pictures of Chiangwade. You'll also see pictures in here of a Jimjubang. We really don't have anything in the U.S. that's like a Jim Bang. Uh, probably the closest thing would be like taking your family to the YMCA. Except it's really not about sports. Now there might be like uh, a room that has bicycles or a place to do yoga. But it's really a place just to chill. The people work very hard in Korea for six days a week. And then on a day off, they take their whole family, kids and parents, and they go to a Jim Bang. It cost us five bucks per person. It was cheap 
You can stay as long as you wanted. Most will stay for the whole afternoon. And then they give you a uniform, and it's a very comfortable pair of shorts and a t-shirt so that you can lounge around. Um, and like I said, there's a place where you can do yoga. Uh, there's a little eating snack bar, but it's about relaxing. So there's a bunch of pillows. You can sit and watch TV. In the wall, there are these little cubbies, and you can go and take a nap or read a book. Um, there's also, uh, you'll see in here, they look kind of like little Eskimo huts made out of stone. They are saunas. And each sauna has different uh, spices or whatever uh, because they believe it does different things to your body. Like one had jade in it, another had jewels, and another one had coal. And they're hot, really hot. And you can see the temperature on the outside. I never could get past the first one because I couldn't handle the heat. And they also have an ice room. So you go in the heat for a while, then you go in the ice because you want to open up your pores. And then you go in the heat and you go in the ice. Now, also in the Jim Bang, there are opportunities in the locker rooms. And girls are in one, guys are in the other. Um, I will tell you that they are more comfortable with nudity than we are. So this was honestly a real challenge to me because I'm pretty conservative when it comes to all of that. Um, but inside the locker rooms, they have these um, hot tubs, basically. And again, they have different spices in each of them. Uh, it's kind of like sitting in a big cup of tea sort of because again they believe they do different things to, for your body and they have different temperatures and after you've been in the hot then you go in the ice cold water and then you go in the hot and you go in the ice cold again opening and closing those pores and then I had an experience that I am so grateful I did but it took everything I had to do it um, and by the way I did this all by myself people that went to Korea said listen if you're gonna go you need to go to a ginger bang because you need to know what their culture is really like. And nobody else had the guts to go with me. So I was all by myself in the English speaking and they were kind of showing me what to do. Um, but they have a massage. It's called a wet massage. Now the first thing you need to know is you're naked, which was a real challenge for me. Um, so the ladies that are giving these are in swimsuits because obviously they're getting wet and it's hot. And so they start by throwing a bunch of hot water on you. And then they take some oil and they start rubbing every tight muscle you have in your body. I'm telling you what, I didn't realize how tense I was. And they just relaxed everything. And then they take and they put kind of a scrub all over your body, like a sand scrub. And they rub that in. And then they rinse you with more buckets of hot water. And I tell you what, by the time you are done, you are just a piece of jello and your skin feels as smooth as a baby's butt. It was an experience I will never forget as long as I live. So you gotta try it. When you go to places like this, find out what they do and try it. It's really awesome. Um, you'll also see pictures of a fish pedicure in here. Have any of you had that? Yeah, where'd you have it? Oh my gosh. Wow, down in Florida, huh? Uh, it is very popular over there and it's becoming more popular in the US. And here's what we did. We went to a bookstore, actually, where you could read a book and get a fish pedicure. And so you basically sit up on this, this bench and you put your feet in a built-in fish tank. And the fish will eat the dead skin off of your feet. So weird. But it works. It really does. Not only that, but they eat the stubble off your legs, ladies. It was crazy. It was crazy. You'll also see pictures from the DMZ. Now remember that Korea is still split, split north and south, right? Just like it was in Korea. The Korean War um, ended in a stalemate and they never resolved it. So it's still split north and south. And the DMZ is this area right here. What does the DMZ stand for? Demilitarized zone, good. Okay, but um, it was called that because it wasn't supposed to be a violent place. It was supposed to be where we didn't shoot at each other. Now, the guys that fought over there said it was called the dead man zone because there was a lot of killing that happened in that DMZ area. Well, I was lucky enough when I was there to be able to go to the DMZ. It's very serious uh, and it's all about security because, you know, we don't hear about it because we're not in Korea, but there are numerous attempts to cross that line. People die, uh, attempts on the assassination of leaders. 
We just don't hear about all of those because we're in America. So we went there, and right on that DMZ, there's a town called Panmunjom. It's right on the border. And this is where the leaders from both sides go to negotiate. So imagine that this is the DMZ line in the building right here, in the middle of the room. And on your side is North Korea, on this side is South Korea. The table sits astride the line, and the North Koreans sit on their side of the table. South Koreans and Americans sit on this side of the table, and they do not cross. Well, when no one is in there, we actually were allowed to cross the line. So I stood in North Korea for like two seconds. It was pretty cool at the time. You'll also see in there a picture of a um, North Korean guard standing in front of their embassy, and then there's like a camera, and they're taking pictures through the window. I don't know if you'll see it or not, but it's in there, okay? Um, they also told us very specifically, when we were driving in the bus, we could take pictures of anything on the North Korean side. Had to do it quickly, but we could. But we couldn't take pictures of anything on the South Korean side because if it ends up on YouTube, it might give the North Koreans an idea of what weapons we use or placement or who's there or whatever. So they were very, very picky about that. I never did get our leader to smile ever. He was a pretty tough guy. So anyway, there's pictures of the DMZ there. Um, I'm sure that if I went there today, I wouldn't be allowed to go to the DMZ and neither would you because it's obviously so intense with North Korea right now. So, so just be aware that that's um, something you'll be seeing as we're passing that around, okay? Okay, let me erase this and let's talk about your assignment. Okay, so here's what you're gonna do for an assignment. You are going to do a bookmark and it has three requirements, okay? Number one, you are going to do some kind of symbol from the Asian culture. And you wanna make it look nice and color it, whether it's colored pencils or markers or crayons, I don't care, but make it look really cool. And I've got some samples here that we'll hand out so you can see them, okay? Because in all three countries, Korea, Japan, and China, symbols are very important to them. So we're going to pick one of those symbols. Now it can be a symbol of something that you are today, or it could be a symbol of something that you want for your future. So for example, on this page, uh, for example, if I want to do well on my semester exams next week, maybe I would want a light heron because that represents doing well on an exam. Okay. So you're gonna put the symbol on there, on your bookmark. Also within your design, you must have the meaning of that symbol. And you must have your first name somewhere in the design. So here you'll see that she did a turtle and it says longevity for long life. And then her name is in the shell of the turtle. Get the idea? And there were some that said, can I do more than one? Like have more than one symbol on my bookmark? Absolutely, that's no problem. So I'll hand some of these out and I'll hand out your bookmarks for you. That is due on Monday. You have two school days to work on it. So it's due on Monday. So let's really quickly go through some of these symbols. And there are tons more if you look online, I promise. Just type in uh, Chinese good luck, or Chinese symbols, Chinese animal symbols, whatever. Okay, so we've got a butterfly, which means that you are going to end up with someone you love as a mate. I talked about the white urine. The lotus flower is very important in Korea. It means to be enlightened. A pig is good luck if you rub its back and kiss its nose, by the way. Uh, but notice it's not a pig like we see. It's a pig with tusks and with pointed ears like a boar. A tiger, of course, is a symbol of strength or courage. Remember, the turtle is a symbol of heaven and earth. And the Koreans, by the way, invented the turtle shell. So the top basically closes up, kind of like a tent, only it's solid. And that's the hope that the cannonballs will roll right over the top of it. The swastika, my people, was not a Nazi invention. They just made it perverse. 
But the swastika is actually a Buddhist symbol that means success. So it's actually something very positive. This is a pattern you'll see a lot in Korea. This is, um, you see how it's intertwined T's? So this T goes into this T, goes into this T like this, you see that? And that means fertility, meaning that a uh, new couple is just married and they wanna have a baby. You'll see things in their house that have that symbol on it. Two birds together means true love. Dragon means royalty or good luck. Sorry, you can't see your dragon over there. A watermelon again means fertility. Now think about it. Why would a watermelon mean fertility? Yeah, because of seeds. You're planting a seed. Good. A fish means success. Now look at the fish. If you're going to do a fish, notice that a fish has fangs and teeth and antlers. So it's not like finding Nemo. You want to make it with teeth and with antlers. A magpie means you're going to get good news in your future. A red crowned crane means spiritual longevity. Mandarin duck means you're going to have a loyal mate because these ducks mate for life. Heite is kind of a fictional character, and you'll see it up in people's houses because it's a protection from fire. A rooster means a warrior or brave. A monkey means a government position, which I think is kind of ironic. <laughs> uh, a bat means good luck. A carp means a self-made man, like I did it myself kind of person. A peasant, pheasant, excuse me, means nobility. A peacock means desired virtues, that you're a virtuous person or someone who stands up for what's right. In Japan, first of all, the sakura cherry blossom is very important in their culture. In fact, you know in the news when they give us the weather, they also give the report on when the cherry blossoms are going to blossom in Japan. Absolutely beautiful. China does a lot more with um, insects. So, for example, you'll see a cicada means living immortally. A cricket means intelligence or good fortune. In fact, they have little crickets as pets in little cages. Maybe you saw Mulan. Um, or they also have cricket fighting too, which is rather interesting. Cat means expelling evil spirits. I suppose that comes from chasing mice out of your house, I don't know. A lion means strength. A phoenix means virtue or duty. An eagle means strength. A deer means wealth or long life. A dog means that you've got good things coming in your life. A snake means woman or superpowers. I love that. A wild goose mean, means marital bliss. She'll be married for a long time. And I think that is it for today. So pick out a symbol that you like. I'd recommend that you draw it on paper first, kind of get an idea of how you want to tie it all together, and then do your bookmark, okay? All right, we'll see you tomorrow.